Steve. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you though about the relate like the relation or a specific part of the relationship of altruism to what's going on here. Um, so I completely agree with you. Like at, at the base, like at the base, altruism is like the dominant driving force that's like driving a lot of this forward. But this is unsatisfying for me in at least two different ways. One of which is, well, if it's really the only thing, then there's, I don't, it doesn't seem to be much to do um, other than maybe what the work that the Ayn Rand Institute is doing, because you really have to attack these kind of things at the most, at the most fundamental level. But then the second reason is, because, and this is something I've been thinking about for a while, which is like the general lack of competence uh, in many of our institutions. And for me, this was typified by an op-ed that David Petraeus wrote in response to October 7th, as though what Israel needs is the expertise of someone whose principal expertise is losing wars. Yep. Um, and I guess I'd love to, for you to opine on that, but I have a specific question, which is, are we way more altruistic than we were a hundred years ago or 50 years ago? Like, how is that playing out? So I'll just say, you know, part of the lack of competence relates also to altruism. Like, what made it possible for Petraeus to become... Now, for example, Petraeus is considered one of this generation's greatest generals, right? He is considered a great general because we live in an altruistic era, in a sense, where it's it's a, it's measured and evaluated based on um, kind of based on altruism. And by those standards, yeah, Petraeus did very well sacrificing American lives for the sake of Iraqi lives and for the sake of Afghan lives. Um, so are we more altruistic? <laughs> it depends what that means, right? I, I think that in, in many respects, um, we have made we have we have made altruism, universal in ways that I don't think it was in the past. Uh, and we have made altruism um, and, and we, we, we take it more seriously to the extent that we don't have anything to counter it with. That is, there's no, I, I think in the past, in America at least, and we'll get to the other past in a minute. In the past in America, there was uh, a, a certain sense of life which was fundamentally selfish which was fundamentally about pursuing your own happiness and success and being achieving and making stuff and building stuff and doing stuff for yourself. And there was, it wasn't explicit. It wasn't a the moral theory. It might've even been viewed as a moral, but it was there. It was, it was it, it, in every aspect of the culture. This was the land where you came to seek opportunity for you and to, to make something of yourself. And, and that that's a remnant of the enlightenment. That is the, the, that enlightenment spirit of progress, of success, of individual achievement, and ultimately, of course, the pursuit of happiness. Um, so, you know, that that aspect, right, is, um, it, that is gone, or, or at least diminished. There's a lot less of that in America today, that what Ayn Rand called the sense of life, or, or you could even broader just call it the spirit of the enlightenment, or the ideas of the enlightenment, have just slowly decayed over the over the decades. It's slowly going away. So there's a sense in which what we're left with is the alternative, uh, which is altruism. That's all there is. That it's just it's just there. We still don't like it. We still don't want it because I think most people want to survive and they want to live and they want to do positive things. But there's no counterforce. There's no counter. Um, ideology there's no counter voice it's all different forms of different variations of different levels of altruism in ways that i don't think existed during world war ii or before that and then and then the the other part of this when i said we've made it universal altruism used to apply to your in-group and so if you were christian yeah you weren't going to be altruistic towards the pagans they either converted Christianity or you slaughtered them. 
you know, there, there was no, so it was within the in-group sacrifice was expected. And ultimately the sacrifice was to God. And in World War II, even you could argue, yeah, I mean, the Germans, right? They started this, we're going to crush them. We're going to defeat them. We're going to do this. Um, there was no uh, altruistic consideration for what the Germans needed or what 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 they what what they wanted, even though uh, domestically FDR's policies were very altruistic with regard to economics and with regard to domestic policy. So I think what's happening in modern times it's been it's been universalized. We now take in a sense love thy enemy like thyself more seriously. We 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 apply altruism to our enemies to. This is this is the 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 uh, uh, this is what multiculturalism has given us, right? Everybody's equal, everybody's the same, everybody's deserving of a sacrifice. Why are you why are you uh, uh, discriminating in favor of the West when when there's all this suffering out there? We need a we need to alleviate it everywhere uh, everywhere in the world. Um, so I think in 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 both those senses, things are worse now. Uh, in terms of the altruism, or more altruistic. Yeah. How does how does that lead to like? Because we just have this group of generals, and we have we've had them since definitely Vietnam, somewhere between the Korean War and Vietnam. Yep. It, they're not even interested in winning. It's like it's it's like it's the furthest thing from their mind when they when they get into these things. Well, I mean, this, it really started with with uh, Korea, right? I mean, you had uh, General MacArthur, um, who wanted to win, and it was committed to winning, and basically was willing to do what was ever, what was necessary to win. And Truman reined him in and basically forced him to resign. And since his resignation, America's not really won a major war, right? And 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 there's and you know in at West Point. If you go in and look at the what they're taught at West Point, they're taught just war theory. They're taught how to lose. They're taught altruism, altruism explicitly in war. Um, they're taught Augustine, right? The, the, you know, Augustine has made a comeback. But you see, Augustine was kind of like, well, it's okay to slaughter civilians if it's in if it's in the you know if you know I'm paraphrasing, but it's okay to slaughter civilians if it'll lead to the expansion of Christianity. But once you get rid of that kind of in-group, out-group perspective, then it's never okay to slaughter civilians. That's Augustine. So, so the the generals have just become um, part of the uh, the altruistic culture. They've they've embraced it and they taught it. They've explicitly taught it. In I mean, if you read just with you, if you read Michael Walter, I mean, it's just it's just altruism one hundred and one. Now he couches it in. You know, yes, this will also lead to victory, and it's better for morale, and it's better, you know. But it's all bullshit. It's it's fundamentally altruism. It's it's the negation of your own interest for the sake of your enemy. It's the worst kind of altruism possible. And and generals have embraced that because there's nothing else. They offered nothing else. You know, when I when I spoke on just war theory um, after 9/11 in front of military groups, they all supported me. But the higher ups couldn't get it to the higher ups. There's actually a, a, a video of me talk about old videos, right? There's a video of me in, uh, after nine 11, at some point talking to the air force, uh, at, at an air force base, uh, for the, for the air force intelligence, I think it was, or something like that. And, uh, the group in front of me are all military people. I mean, that was, nobody else was allowed in. And there's some very, very senior people in the audience. Um, and it's worth watching. It's worth watching for the Q&A and everything, although I think we blanked out the section where they're asking questions because uh, they, they didn't want to have that on video. But um, but it, it's it's worth listening to because uh, just to get to get the fact that the fact that somebody's in the military doesn't actually change them in any significant way. The last thing I'll say is I'm reading your and Elon's book on this right because i guess it's written like 2004 2005 it's elon's book but i've got three essays in it so the, the prediction of the future of that book is shock like, knowing what's going to happen over the next 20 years is absolutely shocking i know um you know I, i've said this before on the show but you know somebody once 
asked me what's the most frustrating thing about my job. And I, and I said, the most frustrating thing about my job is that I know how to fix the problems of the world and nobody will listen to me. And that is, and, and that's an expression of it. You know, I, 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 I made predictions in the 2000, which is always very risky and they've all basically come true and nobody cares. I, I, my profile has now risen because, oh, wow, Yaron was right. Uh, on the contrary, I have more enemies today than I've ever had. Even within the objectivist movement, I have more enemies today than I ever had. Even though almost everything I've said about the the the, the world and America has come true, so so be it. That's that's the world in which we live, and we make the most of it. But um, it's it's super frustrating. It's super frustrating to know that this death and destruction and the path the West is taking are, are not inevitable, uh, and and we know how to to prevent it, and it doesn't matter.